All right, so I'll be very brief since you're not here to listen to me. Our first speaker is going to be Jonathan Tan. Uh, Jonathan is a expert on the theory of star formation, who's also worked quite closely with the observations, done some observational work himself, and, and most of his theory is really focused on sort of uniting theory and observational work on small through uh, what people working on star formation would consider large scales of sort of galactic disks, what somebody like myself who does cosmological simulations would call our small scale. And since that's really a goal of the workshop uh, to bridge these scales, we're very excited to have him here. He's a professor at uh, the University of Florida, and he's really been at the forefront of the theory of star formation on many different scales uh, uh, for several years now. So please join me in welcoming Jonathan. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back here in Caltech. Can everyone hear me? Is the microphone working? So good, I have, it looks like I have an extra few minutes before my start time, which I will, I will use. And this, 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 I've got a little bit cut off at the bottom here, but I will try and remember what I wrote. So this is, uh, what I'm showing is a few uh, different in environments of, of star formation. Four of these are actual observations. So we have uh, a nearby uh, disk galaxy. Then within this, stars form in giant molecular clouds, uh, seen here in CO, uh, the Orion clouds. And in, in these clouds, stars are forming in star clusters, a few parsecs in size scale, typically these uh, star-forming regions. The Orion Nebula, uh, the closest example of a, a region forming massive stars in particular. And then uh, this is an extreme environment, the, the, the nucleus of ARP220, uh, an HST image from Christine Wilson. And uh, this is the one, the odd one out. So this is the frontier, the very first, we think, uh, the, uh, the morphology of, of hydrogen gas as it's collapsing, so, uh, the first nonlinear structures to form in the universe uh, from a simulation by Tom Abell and his collaborators. Uh, so this is a, about a, a million solar mass dark matter halo, which is collected uh, of order 100,000 solar masses of, of baryons uh, cooling and, and, and collapsing to high densities and uh, these are the first uh, stars, we think, to form in the universe. So I will try in this talk to connect some of these scales and, and give you my thoughts on what some of the big open issues are uh, in this field of, of star formation and galaxy evolution. So this is work that's, that's been helped by a number of people from the group in Florida. Uh, so students in orange here, Neil, uh, Ch Chutipong, and, and Ben, uh, and then some of the postdocs, uh, Nicola de Rio and, and Kay Tanaka and then a whole host of collaborators just listing a few uh, here. So this is the framework that we have, a cosmological framework now fairly well established, uh, set from the, <coughs> the cosmic microwave background. This is uh, giving us initial conditions for, for the overall problem uh, that we'd like to follow. So galaxies are baryons orbiting in dark matter halos, and some of those baryons you know, starting as gas turn into stars, and that, of course, is the process we are trying to understand for, for a variety of reasons, to understand the universe uh, we see around us. So in schematic form here then, at around redshifts 30, coming down to maybe 20, we have the first nonlinear structures, uh, eight massive enough to collect baryons. These are so-called first stars or population three stars, where the metallicity of these objects is, is essentially set by what comes out of the Big Bang then set the foundation for the rest of, of galaxy uh, formation and evolution. And we're over here today, 13.7 uh, billion years later. So here at Caltech, of course, there's been a great uh, progress in the last few years trying to probe from the local regions, which we see around here in a well-studied, you know, billions of galaxies seen and studied and resolved, and now uh, at the frontier pushing out uh, to the region where the first stars were forming, uh, the very distant galaxies seen here from photometric uh, dropouts in, in, uh, in infrared. Uh, so some examples of galaxies going out to redshifts of order 12 or so, uh, in this particular case using uh, the enhanced magnification behind a galaxy cluster uh, to see this multiply imaged uh, high redshift candidate. Then there are quasars seen out to the moment redshift of order seven, uh, seen in the infrared here for this particular example at redshift seven. That's about almost 800 uh, million years after the Big Bang. I don't know, you know, I'm not an expert on observations of the very distant universe, but fortunately Wikipedia exists and somebody's maintaining a list here of 
a very high redshift, uh, spectroscopically confirmed redshifts of uh, distant objects. So there's a gamma ray burst here at 8.2. Uh, you see galaxies at 7.5 and so forth. And so this list is, is, is growing you know, year by year. And with JWST coming, uh, we expect uh, great progress. And then for photometric redshifts, a bit less certain. There's the possibility of, of foreground interlopers. Uh, but we have candidates uh, at redshifts of order 10 uh, to perhaps 12, although this is controversial. Uh, so these are uh, photometric uh, redshifts. So the star formation history then is a is the history of our universe, how the stellar content has built up. So this is the, the density of star formation uh, that's going on in each uh, volume of the universe as a function of redshift or look back time. We're here today on the left at uh, zero redshift. And there's this well-known peak at uh, redshifts of order two to three uh, measured from various means. Uh, this is samples uh, where the star formation rate's been measured in the ultraviolet, tracing the hot photons, uh, the short wavelength photons, ultraviolet photons from uh, massive stars, and then also using the infrared reprocessed uh, light as well. And then this is, to me, really amazing. My first work in this, uh, my first scientific paper was back in 1999, uh, working uh, it with Joe Silk and Christoph Balland. And at the time, these were the data we were uh, aiming at here. So we really had only a handful of data points. And you know, we were trying to put constrained theoretical models of star formation rate history. And at the time, I thought, well, uh, we should wait until the data get better. So basically left this uh, field. Uh, but maybe now it's time to come back, because it really is uh, becoming much better defined. There are, of course, many caveats to these measurements. Uh, you, you basically have to assume, for example, an initial mass function of the stars, because you're really sensitive to the output of the most massive stars here. And so that, of course, is, is, a, is a big uh, factor which sets the normalization of the mass content, because most of the mass is in low mass stars. The initial mass function of stars is, is weighted towards the lower mass solar mass stars rather than uh, the higher mass ones, which are dominating the luminosity output. So the physics of star formation, what, what exactly do we need to understand to, under, to uh, have a, you know, a, pic, a picture, an understand, a deep understanding of what's going on here? This is a complex, nonlinear, chaotic process. We have gravity compressing gas, but the, the complexity arises mostly because of the, the things which are resisting that collapse. Various forms of pressure support, which can be simple thermal pressure, just the heat, the, the, the thermal pressure of the gas, to magnetic pressure, turbulence, by which I will loosely refer to bulk motions in the gas, uh, uh, which can also be driven by local sources, which drive, say, certain ram pressure uh, from, say, stellar winds or outflows, supernova uh, remnants radiation pressure from the stars, potentially even gradients in, in the, the relativistic pressure component from cosmic rays. And then in galactic systems where we have orbits, uh, perhaps around a black hole or just generally in a galactic disk, we can have support by rotation and shear. So it's the evolution of these pressure terms which is the, the, the thing we need to worry about. You know, how, how does the gas, is, how is it heated, how is it cooling? How, is, how are magnetic fields being generated by dynamo action? How are they diffusing, how are they coupling to the gas, which is in the star-forming region mostly neutral, just a trace amount of ionization? And then again, the, the generation decay of turbulence. So we need to, to understand this, we need to study chemical evolution as well. We have dust particles uh, of heavy elements, and we have other heavy elements which control cooling. We need to understand the chemical uh, makeup of this uh, material. Uh, also for the ionization fraction in this mostly neutral gas, this trace amount of ionization is still important as a coupling between that gas and the magnetic field. Stars are forming somehow with a range of masses. We'll discuss a bit more details, but once they're formed, uh, often they're in binary systems, often they're, they're born in clusters, so we need to worry about dynamical evolution, gravitational dynamics of such systems. Then, of course, stellar structure and evolution, uh, which we think is reasonably well developed, but there are still issues for example, how rotation affects uh, stellar structure and evolution. Because these, the outputs of those models then are the, the feedback and the metal enrichment uh, from the end process of, of, of the stars. And so this feedback then has several forms of, which are of interest. So when stars are forming, accreting, they also generate outflows, uh, bipolar outflows, ma uh, magnetically driven uh, and, and rotationally driven from the inner accretion disk. They have winds, in particular, 
main sequence winds and, and later stage winds from massive stars. And then, of course, the, the, their radiative feedback, which can dissociate and ionize a gas, dissociate the H2 in particular is important, and the radiation pressure acting on uh, particularly dust, and then finally, uh, supernovae. And so we have this complicated set of differential equations which, which can follow these processes in principle, but how do we initialize? So what are the, the, the boundary conditions on the problem? We have to, even for a simple system, a relatively small system like a cluster, uh, just, just one cluster, perhaps a parsec across, we have a huge range in scales, 12, at least 12 orders of magnitude going from this parsec scale down to the, the size scales of individual stars. You know, light, several light years compared to light seconds across uh, these uh, stars. And so, you know, this three-dimensional multi, uh, the problem also with time, uh, this huge range of scales, inevitably, in a computer, if you try and put these equations in here, you are going to run into a, a problem where you, you, you need to give up at some scale, or you have to make some approximation at the smallest scale. Otherwise, your simulation will, will only be advancing on the time steps uh, relevant to that shortest scale, which you know, could be the sound crossing time of a star, uh, which is very short, you know, minutes or hours compared to the uh, perhaps million year evolution even for this cluster as it's forming. So there is a need for subgrid uh, models, and that's one of the themes of this uh, workshop. So because of this complexity, there are many open questions, and I've, I've divided this into two pages, one for star formation and one for galaxy. Uh, formation and evolution. So on the star formation scales of individual stars or, or star clusters, uh, we have questions to do with causation. Stars are forming from molecular clouds, but it, as I'll show, most molecular gas is very inefficient. So there are some regions which decide to form a star cluster. Now why that is, is it some external trigger or is it, is it uh, stochastic instabilities going on in the gas uh, is uh, still debated. And then the initial conditions, what, what do they mean? The initial conditions say when a protostar, a star as a hydrostatic object, a seed starts to form and accrete from its gas, at that stage, the gas from which it's accreting, how close is it to uh, equilibrium, either pressure equilibrium or a virial equilibrium, which is energy balance between uh, self-gravity and internal energy? And then exactly how does the gas accrete? So in particular, for understanding individual star formation, there's at least two classes of, of models uh, which are being debated, which is uh, one is core accretion, where the gas first organizes itself into a population of cores, self-gravitating gas structures of a range of masses, which then collapse. Uh, or in clustered environments, competitive accretion is also debated. It's a, it's a more chaotic process where small protostellar seeds uh, basically randomly accrete material by bondi hoyle accretion due to their orbits and their positions in this uh, collapsing cluster potential. And even mergers between stars are debated. So then how quickly does the process uh, you know, take to, to, to complete? Is it a fast or slow process, uh, in particular relative to the dynamical time scale, which could be a free fall time or a sound crossing time of the system? And so the end result then of, of, of the star formation process is this initial mass function, the IMF, which has some characteristic peak today around a solar mass or just below, and then this power law tail uh, declining as uh, quite a steep power of mass, uh, dn by dm going as m to the minus 2.35, so that most of the mass is at low mass end, uh, but the, the high mass stars, of course, still important, and whether, in fact, there's a, a cutoff here at the maximum mass, and how these things vary with environment. Also, the binary properties are much less well-constrained observationally, but, but of course there are some constraints with a large fraction of stars uh, today seen in, in binary systems. So for galaxy formation, the first stars and galaxies, we'd like to know their particular properties. What were their masses? How, how did they then set the, the environment, the foundations for galaxy formation, the mechanical, radiative, and chemical enrichment and feedback? And then supermassive black holes, a vital component of galaxy uh, formation evolution models we still don't know where they came from. So that's a very basic question. And, and when did they arise? How did they arise? And also, how do they relate to, um, you know, to gal both galaxy formation, but also how is their growth perhaps regulated by star formation? Then, as we'll hear later from Adam Leroy, I haven't seen him yet, but is he, he is here at the back there. Great. Uh, he, he will tell us about uh, resolved uh, studies of, 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 of galactic disks 
And there are various uh, relations, empirical relations uh, seen in, in the star formation activity in disks compared as a function of these galaxy properties like gas content or orbital properties. And so what is, what is the physics underlying uh, those mechanisms, th th those laws? And then extreme environments. And there are a whole range of things. There's just three where we can go to ha very high star formation rate uh, and, and gas concentrations in the nuclei of galaxies. Uh, also sometimes connected with AGN, active galactic nuclei activity, or at low metallicity. How do, how do things uh, change there? So for the first stars, let me summarize what I think is the, the latest uh, work here. So this is, uh, we have um, a cosmological framework, dark matter and baryons, dark matter structures forming first. So you have ha small halos, we call them mini halos, forming and growing in mass by merging together. This is uh, uh, redshift 24. By redshift 20, we have a, ha a mini halo of maybe a million solar masses of total mass which has come together, and by 18 then, this is now uh, has a deep enough potential that the baryons, most, mostly hydrogen and some helium, uh, can cool down and settle into this uh, structure. So that's the, these are the first uh, nonlinear objects where baryons are going to do something. And so in, this can now be followed numerically in, in, in uh, supercomputers, uh, both SP with the smooth particle hydro method and the adaptive mesh refinement method to follow the baryonic uh, collapse to very high densities, basically stellar densities. And so what they do is follow the non-equilibrium chemistry, which is the most important thing is to work out what your main coolants are, which are, uh, we think, uh, molecular hydrogen, which it forms, uh, unlike today, which it forms on dust grains, it forms in the gas phase, uh, catalyzed uh, uh, by free electrons uh, in, in this gas, a small amount of free electrons. And so there's a trace amount of H2 forming here via the H minus uh, channel, which is the main coolant and, and allows the gas to cool down to about 200 Kelvin. Uh, and th and this, tra this, cool this transition has a critical density of about 10 to the 4. So this actually sets properties, perhaps convergent properties, of a whole range of different halos which, which approach these kinds of conditions where we have maybe several thousand solar masses of, of, of baryonic gas in, in scales of inside about 10 parsecs. Now, at, at very high densities, around 10 to the 10, we have three-body H2 formations starting to occur, so we really build up our coolants, and that then, in the center of this uh, structure, leads to a loss of pressure support and uh, inside-out collapse, which is a, a model also developed for, for uh, nearby low-mass star formation happens. So then the pressure support's removed, this gas uh, structure, which previously was contracting very slowly because the cooling was weak, now starts to collapse, uh, as I say, from the inside out. And so like, this has all been followed numerically. You, you then, at the, at the center of this collapse, form a, a hydrostatically supported object, a star, a protostar still accreting. Uh, now very high densities. It's optically thick uh, with this kind of temperature here. And it's a very low mass. Um, a, 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 this seed is, is much less than a solar mass, but it's embedded in thousands, perhaps even hundreds of thousands of solar masses of material. And so the question then has been, what happens next? how much of this mass actually makes it to the star? Does it form a, only a one solar mass star? Does it form a 10 solar mass star, a 1,000 solar mass star, 10,000 solar mass star? What, what is going to happen next? So numerically, one has, something has to give at this point because, as I mentioned, your time scales of this very dense structure are extremely short. And so we, we need to do something else. And that's something else, which you can't really read here, is, develop, is sort of five years of my life. Is, is working out uh, some kind of subgrid model for that process. And essentially, then, we have tried to consider the physics, which, is in, which we'll, we think is going to be involved in the, uh, how this, this object is going to gain material and potentially stop accretion. We defined uh, two kinds of population three stars. So population three, this refers to a difference between the, cl the classic galactic populations of one and two which are seen in our galaxy. Population three is defined as having a metallicity essentially uh, coming out of the Big Bang, or, or we, a bit more precise here, less than some critical value such that the metallicity is irrelevant. So it doesn't really matter if you had that tiny uh, you know, few carbon atoms in this gas. So it's, it's less than some critical value so that metallicity has no effect on their formation, so basically negligible cooling, which we think is around 10 to minus 5 uh, if we include dust. Um, or their internal evolution of the stars. And through the CNO cycle, in fact, that's a, a lower limit of about 10 to the minus 8 
uh, of solar metallicity. So they're basically essentially metal-free uh, gas coming out of Big Bang nuclear synthesis. Then two kinds of population three stars. 3.1s we defined as initial conditions then for these structures are set by cosmology. So they're forming in these halos, but these halos have never been influenced uh, significantly by any other astrophysical source, which could be another star or could be a, an AGN. And 3.2s are still this, this uh, metal, essentially metal-free gas, but have been influenced by, say, radiation from perhaps ionization from another source. So it's these 3.1s which are simpler to model because, of course, once you start having to deal with external influence, there's a whole host of other parameters. So these, from the, going from the bottom up here, are the, the physics that we, we think we need to under, understand to work out what these pop three stars are going to be. So the initial conditions, as we've seen, are set by uh, cosmology and following the collapse of baryons in simulations. All groups agree, essentially, on this uh, process of set by the microphysics of H2 cooling. And once you have such a structure and it's going to collapse then, its collapse rate will essentially be the, uh, it's approximately its density divided by its local freefall time. The material will, will then collapse to the center. And that defines an accretion rate, which for typical, uh, typical uh, uh, conditions in this gas can be very high, a few hundredths of a solar mass per year which is much higher than the typical accretion rate we see today, especially for low mass stars. Then we have rotation, so we'll form a disk, and that disk has the uh, potential to fragment, so one needs to worry about that. It is also a place where turbulence can occur, and so it could generate magnetic fields by dynamo action, uh, potentially up to equipartition values. At the very center, we have a, a protostar, and that undergoes normal protostellar evolution, which can include things like uh, nuclear burning, so deuterium burning, for example. Uh, but it's, it's accreting as a, very, as a relatively large structure, perhaps an AU in size, uh, certainly much bigger than a, a solar radius. And as it's accreting, it's, it's, mostly, it's, it's mostly supported by its internal energy, which is it's inherited from accretion. And then it's radiating that energy away. Uh, as it gets more massive, it's radiating faster and faster to support itself. And then it will, at some, at some point, it will this is a, as a function of mass here, the size of the star. At some point, that star basically radi radiates away its energy and undergoes Kelvin-Helmholtz contraction down to the main sequence. And that, when that happens depends, of course, on how quickly it's accreting material. The faster it accretes, the, the, lot, the, the higher mass it is where it still stays above the main sequence. If it's accreting very slowly, it has more time to settle down to the main sequence and will reach the main sequence at a lower mass. Reaching the main sequence is important because that means your star is hot. It's producing a lot of ultraviolet photons, which can basically disrupt accretion. So this radiative feedback then depends on when you land on the main sequence. And what we estimated with purely analytic models was when the ionized region, the H2 region, uh, which has a temperature of maybe 20,000 Kelvin, uh, basically becomes large enough to disrupt the accretion disk. And we estimated that a critical scale then would be somewhere in the range of 100 to 200 solar masses. Now, yes? Right. Well, the dark matter is being followed in these numerical simulations. It's in here, and it has defined where the star forms. The baryons have cooled and actually deepened the potential. They, they, they dominate the mass density inside about a parsec. But they do drag in dark matter with them, and, and that could well be an important uh, point. But dynamically, they're not, they're not important in this uh, inside a parsec. Well, I like you know, trying to build these uh, structures here, but you know, without constraints here, this is very unstable because we could have got something wrong at, at various stages and, and with a pure analytic model, uh, it's difficult. So parts of this problem have been tackled, some by Hal York here and his collaborators, carrying out simulations of this, say, this radiation pressure stage where the feedback from that star disrupts accretion. And so in their simulations, these are uh, two-dimensional uh, simulations uh, where the protostar is in the middle here and its radiative feedback is disrupting accretion uh, for their particular simulation uh, initial conditions, they found accretion ended at around 40 solar masses. And so that was their estimate for the mass of the first stars. 
there are now groups doing a whole host that basically taking cosmological halos and uh, carrying out such such radiation uh, you know, hydro simulations to estimate masses of the first stars. So here's a, from uh, this is Hirano et al. 2014. They've done a hundred of these objects with 2D calculations. So here from their simulation of uh, when they form. So one at redshift 35 here, but most coming at redshifts uh, 20 or so. And then this is their estimates for by this radiative feedback process, following all of the physics I essentially mentioned there. Uh, the mass spectrum of the first stars, ranging up to, in some cases, 1,000 solar masses or so, but with a peak around 100, or just below 100. And then from Sousa et al. 2014, here they're doing uh, about 60 halos, now with 3D uh, radiation hydro simulations, and getting slightly lower masses. Uh, with 3D, they begin to see more fragmentation in the structure. So I applied our analytic models uh, back in 2010 to only 12 halos from Brian O'Shea, and with these analytic models, which of course don't allow necessarily to resolve all the fragmentation, we were getting somewhat higher masses, around 100 solar masses, up to 1,000. Uh, but uh, you, know, you, you see how the field is progressing. These are based purely on analytic models. Uh, these are now based on full radiation hydro uh, simulations. So here are some open questions, I would say, which related to POP3. So there is some debate still about the, the degree of fragmentation from low fra relatively low fragmentation scenarios where you form single massive stars or perhaps binaries to relatively high fragmentation cases. I I'm, I'm tend to be more on this uh, side of things, but there are, there are claims of, of much higher levels of fragmentations in some circumstances, which is important because if you form very low mass population three stars, well, they could still be around today in principle, and so you'd have a chance to see them. Then the effect of dark matter. So if dark matter is a, is a weakly interacting massive particle, it self-annihilates, that's a source of energy. The star is forming at this cusp of dark matter and that energy input could have a dramatic effect, which has not been included in the work I showed you uh, previously, but there are groups, including us, uh, thinking about it. Then work that was done here, the dark matter streaming, there's an offset in velocities of the dark matter from the baryons, so that then affects things and can delay the uh, onset of POP3 star formation. Basically, you need a, a more massive mini halo, uh, so there, there's some effects there. Then these population 3.2s, the, the, the general thought is they will be of lower mass. They have had higher levels of, of ionization, which promotes H2 formation, and so promotes cooling, and so you have smaller genes masses, essentially. And then how these things relate to black hole formation, first galaxies, globular clusters, one of the key observational constraints, there are not many, relate to the kinds of metals produced in supernovae from these uh, potentially massive stars, which Heger and Woosley and Umeda and, and Nomoto have been thinking about. But how reliable are these models for predicting uh, nuclear synthetic yields? So unfortunately, the first star observables are very indirect. I mean, these are the kinds of astrophysical effects they could have, reionization, first metal enrichment. Uh, they, they, they light up the universe a little bit. Uh, they potentially explode as supernova, supernova and gamma ray bursts, but these are all very indirect constraints. And even with JWST, if the masses of these things are 100, even 1,000 solar masses, you won't, they're too faint to see. You, you maybe see clusters of these things if, if, if such things exist. So at the moment, we have very few constraints here, and it's a challenge. One of the constraints which is being pushed on quite hard is looking for stars in our galaxy today, which are very low metallicity. They may have been enriched by only a single supernova, and so here's an example which has a, of a very iron poor star. You know, he, here are some example stars which are also low metallicity. So here's a metallicity of minus 4.1, minus 5.3. Here's the iron line. Here's a, this new star with basically no iron at all. Uh, it has, some, you know, has other elements, carbon and so forth. But these, this is then modeled as, as enrichment from a single supernova, perhaps a, a progenitor mass of maybe 60 solar masses. Then here's a, examples. You can't see the details, but uh, basically has low carbon over iron and, and magnesium over iron, and has large odd even effects, which is a prediction of, of supernovae, uh, so-called pair instability supernovae from very massive stars, uh, where, where the helium core mass at time of collapse is more than 100 solar masses. But uh, it's, you know, it's not that these, these are very indirect uh, constraints, of course, and rely on the accuracy of those models. So that's where we stand with POP3. Let me move quickly to galactic uh, disks then, so things we can see. We have a better constraint, but we don't know the initial conditions very well. 
And so here I think we can be helped by what, is, what we're aiming at to understand is, is some kind of quasi-equilibrium of star formation rate in such a system and the interstellar medium properties. And that's our target for, for how we want to model the system. So I won't go into too much detail here, but there are empirical relations which basically measure the surface density of star formation rate, so how many solar masses per year are forming in each kiloparsec squared patch of this some galactic disk, and these are normal galaxies averaged as a whole, and these are more extreme starbursts that Rob Kennicott compiled, and this is a power law with slope steeper than unity, around 1.4. This lo lower axis is the gas content, the mass of, of gas per unit area in the disk in solar masses per parsec squared. So this work back from the late 90s has been extended, and we'll hear more from Adam, uh, re resolved inside internal gal nearby disk galaxies, uh, s uh, populations of, of higher redshift systems from Reinhard Genzel and his collaborators also following this relation. There is another way to think of this, of this star formation activity, and that's to, to, to plot the surface density of star formation rate versus the gas content divided by a measure of the dynamical time of the galaxy. And so here the units you see are, are, are good and understood. There is some amount of gas in a galaxy disk, and on some time scale related to its dynamics, say its orbit, uh, the, that gas is being turned into stars. And so the data also fall along this now a, a, a power law of slope unity, and this this slope of, of order of, of this line of slope unity is not a fit to the data; it's just, just been put across the data here. And so it seems that at least on these scales, you can think of galaxies as turning some fixed fraction of their gas into stars per orbit. And that fraction, in fact, is about 11% if you normalize for a disk average at the, with the outer orbital time scale. Or if you go into annually in nearby galaxies, it's about 4%. Yes? Is it right, so this, this is, if you take the, these are, disk, these are disk averages out to some radius, and if you take that outer radius time, as your time scale, it's about 11% averaging inside. If you go into annually, these are kiloparsec wide annually, and you use the center of that bin as your estimate of the orbital time, then you get uh, 4%. And this prediction then would say that it's more than Well, these are, these are starburst disks, as you know. These are small systems. Well, these are, these are individual galaxies. Right. Right. So here they've used the outer dynamical time. If, if I go into these individual galaxies and resolve them, then I, and I take the local <laughs> orbital time, then I get 4% here as the best estimate. I'm not saying this is necessarily the best model for explaining it, but, but if I had to pick one number on average, it's 4% it's of gas per orbit. So this similar work has been done at the higher redshift systems, and again, this, this uh, dynamical, this taking the, the amount of here molecular gas divided by an estimate of dynamical time scale uh, seems to, to, to do also a, a reasonable job at predicting the star formation rates. With Adam, in fact, we've, we've tried to go one step beyond this and actually look for second parameter effects. So in particular, galaxies have a rotation curves where the, you know, here's the circular velocity as a function of radius, and typical galaxies will have an inner region where it's uh, rising closer to solid body, then becomes more flat. This beta is the logarithmic slope of this uh, gradient of this how the circular speed changes with radius. So here there's a high shear regime, a low shear regime. And what we did then was look at this, this efficiency per orbit parameter. So here typically around 4% when, when, when you have the bulk of the disks uh, in this flat part. Uh, and then as we go to higher beta, so more uh, the steeper slope here, in fact less shear, we, we're seeing a, a, a decline in this efficiency per orbit, which is uh, statistically significant. And in, in particular, there's a, a model which, which I have worked on, which involves the triggering of star formation by shear-driven processes through GMC collisions, which actually uh, you know, makes this kind of prediction. So 
the data are, are becoming good enough to look for second parameters. This is not the only one we can look at. We can also look at uh, things like uh, the presence of bars and also spiral arms, and a number of groups are doing that. So it, <coughs> these are some relations on galactic scales. Looking inside galaxies, of course, we know that star formation you know, is occurring in small structures. And I, I'm not going to say too much about giant molecular clouds, because Nick will give us a review of that. But even on these scales, you see, the star formation is also proceeding in a, in, a, in a way which is very inefficient, if you think of it as a, as a mass of gas divided by some dynamical time scale. So here we defined an efficiency per freefall time. Now, this is a local freefall time in the gas set by its density. And we find values of, again, of 1% or a few percent. So this was first done by uh, uh, Zuckerman and Evans, considering the galactic GMC population. We have maybe a billion solar masses of gas in giant molecular clouds at a density of around 100 particles per cubic centimeter. All, of the, all galactic star formation is occurring in these GMCs. If you took this billion solar masses and divided by free, the freefall time, you'd get a star formation rate of maybe uh, several hundred solar masses per year whereas the observed rate is only a few solar masses per year. And so that leads to an efficiency of just 1% per local freefall time. With Mark Krumholz, we extended this to higher density traces. So infrared dark clouds are denser regions in these giant molecular clouds, perhaps a couple, an order of magnitude denser or a bit more. And we think all star formation, again, proceeds through these denser clumps or clouds. And if we, from samples of infrared dark clouds, again, try and do this estimate, we we find, again, perhaps just 1, one or 2% of the gas in those infrared dark clouds is turning into stars per local freefall time, which is now much shorter because we're at higher densities. And this can be extended up to the Orion Nebula cluster. Individual star clusters, which have show age spreads, can be uh, put on this diagram. Uh, and also higher density traces uh, in, in either extragalactic systems or in, in galactic clumps. This shaded region is a model of turbulence I'll discuss in a second, uh, which which again predicts that, from Krumholtz and McKee, which predicts the rate of star formation in a turbulent medium should be quite low. So that's in regions which are forming stars, but actually most of the gas in giant molecular clouds, certainly in the low density envelopes, uh, parameterized here by visual extinction, less than say 10 magnitudes, is actually inert to star formation. It's, it's not forming stars at all. And so has ver there's a threshold. And this question then of how sharp this threshold is, or the precise nature of it is, is being debated by a number of groups, uh, but it seems below AV of uh, 4, we have, which is this level of surface density, we have a, a very rapid decline in star formation activity. And so the star formation activity is certainly much more clustered uh, with respect to the distribution of molecular gas. So how do we explain that? One idea is turbulence. OK. So I will try and wrap up here. Uh, turbulence could explain this. And turbulence can be described by several parameters, the, the virial parameter, the Mach number, how it's being driven, and then the strength of magnetic fields. And it leads to a distribution of gas densities. And if you take that distribution of gas densities and then work out what fraction is going to become unstable, you can derive a star formation rate. And so that's what a number of authors have done here. Uh, and they predict then star formation efficiencies per freefall time, which are very, uh, very re relatively low, uh, perhaps a few percent. Uh, it can also ex explain the initial mass function if you take the, uh, the, the kinds of structures which are, are forming from this turbulence. You get a, a characteristic peak and a, and a power law tail. And it can be applied then to global galaxies. So you take uh, structures, giant molecular clouds, you assume they're virialized and, turbulence, and turbulent. They know about the galactic disk. Uh, by, pressure, by their surface pressures, and then you can, if you knew the, the mass fraction in GMCs, you could work out uh, the overall star formation rate. And so these kinds of models have been developed, uh, adding complexity for different regimes and to try and match this data. So we're all happy we could go to the beach. Since I'm out of time, uh, I will just perhaps leave you with some worries about galactic, uh, you know, th this issue. <laughs> Uh, there are potential problems with turbulence models, and all the results so far are for hydrodynamic turbulence rather than um, what we think might be happening is, is, is more magnetized structures, which would be alphanic or transalphanic turbulence. Turbulence decays quickly, so you've got to maintain it. The simulations sh uh, have driven turbulence, but real, real GMCs and real galaxies 
that driving is, is not in such an ideal fashion. There could be larger scale processes and colliding flows, giant molecular cloud collisions, supernova driven feedback. The periodic boundary conditions are, again, not reasonable for real systems, and these thresholds are fairly arbitrary. So I, magnetic fields, I think, are actually a key point, and I'll, I'll leave you with these thoughts here on them. There are a number of observations locally of relatively strong magnetic fields in gas, and these magnetic fields then may help keep the star formation rate fairly low. And recently with uh, uh, Paul Goldsmith and collaborators, we've actually measured this, these field strengths in some of these clouds and found them to be uh, dynamically important. So I had a lot more slides to show, I'm afraid. Sorry, I've, I've, I've uh, gone over here. Uh, but let me jump to my conclusions and you can ask me if there's any time. When, when, when is my sort of overall slot supposed to end? 9.30? Uh, uh huh. So what I, if I had a little more time, I would have described basically three efforts then. Right. So those three efforts are global galaxy simulations of isolated galaxies and what kind of physics needs to be put in. Then, with that debate over, <laughs> there are people who are uh, ca carrying out larger cosmological zoom-in simulations. And a, a number of issues there. There are extreme environments, and then people are, are now at a point where they are uh, doing whole populations of galaxies. So let me try and summarize, if I have a few minutes, just to go through my main points, and you can always ask me during this, this week. So star formation is complex. We struggle to understand even nearby systems. We have this issue of initial conditions, dependence on subgrid models, and the connection to observables. For population three, we have well-defined initial conditions. Latest results suggest these very first objects are maybe uh, massive, maybe 10, 100 times the mass of the sun. But you know, precise prediction is very difficult and challenging, and it's very hard to test. And so accurate modeling of the subsequent activities, I, uh, subsequent generations, is, is not necessarily going to say it's hopeless, but until we have much better observational constraints of, of what's going on at redshifts 10 to 15 to 20, uh, it's, it's going to be very difficult. This galaxy star formation is increasingly well observed, so GMCs in nearby galaxies that we'll hear about. Understanding the star formation rate, what sets it, the initial mass function, and the role of feedback are key problems. There are elements that, these are the elements I think are important for subgrid models. Star formation rates are low, efficiencies per freefall time of perhaps just a, a percent or so, above some threshold density. So if you want to put a subgrid model into a galaxy, you need to not just have stars forming from gas. Also, stars should not form from just molecular gas that's in your simulation. Stars form, I think, from magnetically moderately supercritical molecular gas at AVs greater than about 10, mediated by alphanic or subalphanic turbulence uh, and dynamically important large-scale fields. The star formation is localized in parsec scale clusters but knows about global dynamics. And I would advocate a, a shear mediated mechanism of giant molecular cloud interactions. Finally, it's important to have simple observable test cases, particular nearby cases we can look at, uh, which span a range of environments. So low metallicity systems, uh, galactic center regions, and starbursts are, are obvious examples. Once you've developed this complicated model, you then want to push it and make it work in different uh, regions. And, and these, are some case, these are some areas where uh, there's some progress being made. OK, I'll stop here. Thank you.